John, do you want to introduce him again? Maybe oh, goody. <laughs> right this time. Yeah. Oh, that's not going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Story Weavers, the podcast where we discuss anything and everything story related. Here, we'll delve into inspiration, plot, structure, character, and dialogue, be it in books, movies, music, comics, television, or anything else. We'll be covering it from conception to reception. We'll be discussing between ourselves as well as with other creators and fans about their experiences, routines, and techniques. Join us and find your next inspiration. We're your hosts, Dean Bradley. And John William Worth. And And this this is Story Story Weavers. Weavers. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Story Weavers, the podcast where we talk about anything and everything story related. Today, we have a special guest, Josh Pomponio. I almost did it again. Wonderful. (laughs) Um, He's a filmmaker, um, photographer, I would like to say. Correct, Josh? Sure. Yeah, I do a bit of everything. (laughs) That's good. Um, And this is going to be a two-part episode. Um, in this part, we'll be discussing his love for film and particularly for Orson Welles. And in the second part, we'll be discussing his own film, Analogic, which takes a lot of cues from Orson Welles as well as other filmmakers. Um, so, Josh, welcome. Hi, right, thank you for having me. Thank of you. course. It's good to have you here. We've uh, The three of us have known each other for quite a while now, so uh, mm-hmm. it's fun to have you on here and talk about some of the more creative side of our personalities yeah. yeah we always have interesting uh conversations whether it's on front of camera or uh you know uh just the three of us chatting so i'm looking forward mm-hmm. to diving into these subjects with you guys yeah all right well Perfect. let's let's get into it so um i know you're a big fan of orson wells uh just maybe a little bit of background for people who aren't as familiar with Wells, who was Orson Welles and why are you so fascinated by him? Uh, well, Orson Welles uh, is first and foremost an American filmmaker from uh, starting from the 1940s all the way to the, the 1980s, I guess you could say. You had a really long uh, career as both an actor, director, writer, performer. Uh, he, uh, at the age of 25, he co-wrote, produced, directed, and starred in what is now considered you know, one of the greatest films ever made is Citizen Kane. And yeah. he developed a really unique visual style that has influenced, uh, you know, probably probably every filmmaker that has come since, um, you know, whether it's in America or France, he's had a really long lasting effect on American cinema and has, uh, you know, inspired other filmmakers who have also later on inspired, you know, other generations of filmmakers. So he's a really, really powerful, really big, uh, literally and figuratively figure in uh, American, uh, Amer- not just American cinema, but I think in, in American history uh, in, in general, for sure. Mm-hmm. Just and world in, cinema. In entertainment. Mm-hmm. And, on, and I know um, from, from the few films of his I've seen, there, there are a lot of political undertones in them, well, at, in them as well. So uh, that definitely helped, I think, define a lot of his work too. Maybe a little mm-hmm. more subtextually than some people realize but mm-hmm. yeah the, the, the politics are really subtle in his film but also really powerful at the same time mm-hmm. and i think unfortunately uh particularly with citizen kane there's been an attempt to depoliticize him because even though i think nowadays and maybe in more recent history uh culturally the his politics are more uh, uh more widespread and, and more common uh, in 1941, you know, he was really uh, the odd man out for kind of American politics and uh, maybe not totally American politics, but at least in Hollywood, his politics were much more progressive mm-hmm. than he's given credit for. And Kane in particular um, is a much more politically progressive film than I think we want to realize. Mm-hmm. I mean, with Citizen Kane, at least he was going after who was the newspaper mogul? I forget the name uh, at Hearst, the moment. William, William Randolph Hearst. Hearst. Yeah. yeah, and I think at at that time it was considered unusual to kind of like mimic someone else's life, even in a fictional sense, warts and all. And Hearst led the charge to be like, "No, this is really, really bad." Um, so I mean, that was daring in and of itself. Mm-hmm. I don't know, maybe political, but 
he pushed a lot of boundaries. Like you mentioned, he changed cinema and the way you tell stories with film. For sure. Uh, the film was definitely linked, uh, you know, forever to, to Hearst, you know, unfortunately for Hearst, who tried to, you know, destroy the film and had this huge, you know, campaign against it. And at one point, he you know, he at the Oscars. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he, he oh, wow. pressured, um, he pressured the heads of all the major studios to, to pull their money together and buy the negative from RKO in order to, to destroy it. And it was really, uh, it was it was really close to coming to that. And, you know, Wells had to do a lot of kind of campaigning behind the scenes with you know the people at RKO, not just studio people, but also like the the shareholders of of the of the studio. Uh, one of whom who had had a pretty big um, pretty big shareholding in the studio was uh, Nelson Rockefeller, and the oh. Rockefellers were were kind of enemies with uh, with Hearst, you know. Um, mm -hmm. And I I think. Um, I, I think Nelson Rockefeller, maybe behind the scenes, didn't, you know, he he persuaded the board to, you know, to not sell to her, you know, not to, not to cave to Hearst, uh, because uh, you know there there was the that kind of political fighting going on. You know, he didn't want to win, he didn't want to lose to Hearst, he didn't want to uh, ha have Hearst have that kind of influence. And um, mm -hmm. yeah, I remember there was one story I I had read somewhere that Hearst. At some point, had Wells had heard that Hearst had hired like a prostitute to ambush him in his hotel room, and that a photographer would be there to take the picture just to mm -hmm. show them like yeah. in cahoots, and that he would want a smear campaign just against Orson defamation. Wells. Yeah, so Orson Wells stayed in another hotel that night, and there was no knowing if that was true or not. So this that man was willing to do anything to try to bury <laughs> this movie. Yeah. Um, an, an interesting question I, I just want to throw at you um, because Citizen Kane. You know, as we've said before, you look at it now and it's a very, very normal movie by today's eye. But back then it was mm. revolutionary in a lot of its techniques. It wasn't recognized for that for a very as that for a very, very long time. Like I think until the 60s or 70s, I'm almost tempted to say, do you think some of that was because of Hearst trying to bury the movie? Or do you think people just truly didn't recognize it for how masterful and how ahead of its time it was? I don't think it's entirely due to due to Hearst because at the, at the time you know it didn't do well financially. It got it got really good reviews at the time. It, so it was it was uh, if you read more of the contemporary reviews, it's it's surprising how um, how right they kind of were. Like a lot of people at the time recognized uh, its achievement. It, you know, they didn't quite say it's the greatest film of all time because it was you know still a, kind of a new art form. But I think one of the reasons why it it didn't really uh, it, why, why it kind of took some time to age and took some time to come into its own right is uh, kind of Wells' subsequent career after Kane. You know, Magnificent mm -hmm. Amersons wasn't a really big success. Um, you know, they, they totally recut that movie. And because of the, the drama and, and the, the damage to his reputation after Kane, uh, he, he was unable to really fi you know, um, finalize Had a hard time Amersons. finding funding. Or, yeah, not not necessarily okay, funding no. funding, but to to finalize uh, Amerson's and even his project in Brazil, which you know his project in Brazil, it's all true. I think did more damage, or maybe just as much damage to his reputation and career as the fallout from Citizen Kane, because oh. at the end of his time in Brazil, like you know the six month period, you know the the press, you know, kind of at Hearst insistence, and also the Hollywood insiders who didn't really appreciate. This young, you know, he was he was 25 when when he made Kane, 26 I think when he was in Brazil doing his whole adventure, and 27 when he came back. So the establishment didn't really like his kind of maverick sensibilities, and you know, not just Hearst with his own newspapers, but also the insider kind of columns and writing. You know, they they really tarnished reputation because of uh, what they perceived as his, um, his flamboyant nature in Brazil, you know, going over schedule, going over budget. When in reality, Archeo never told him what kind of money he had. Uh, they were, uh, they were actually guaranteed money from the government because it was a government funded, uh, basically project. Right. It's all true to go to Brazil. And, uh, the, I, I think the part of the contract was that the government would pay, uh, all the expenses up to a certain amount that Archeo accrued. And at the time, you know, everyone's like, "Oh, Wells, you know, spent a million dollars. He, you know, went over budget." 
but I think Joseph McBride found out like in the eighties or nineties going through like RKO archives that he, he wasn't even near the, the, the maximum budget that the, the government would subsidize. You know, he was actually way <laughs> under budget uh, and, and RKO weren't dispersing funds to him that he was kind of contractually obligated to, to have at his disposal. And, yeah. and, but that kind of, um, uh, that kind of behavior, you know, followed him for the rest of his life, wh- whether or not it's justified, you know, his, his, this idea that he would go out w- without a script, without no money, run out of money, go find money elsewhere, which, you know, it's something that's partially true, but it all comes from, uh, the fallout from, from Kane and from, uh, from it's all true. And, and, you know, he was just never able to, to overcome that, that damage to his reputation. Huh. Mm. I didn't know any of that. Yeah. Um, so, well, so every, so a lot of people, at least when it comes to Wells, the big ones they know, they know Citizen Kane, they know War of the Worlds. Um, mm-hmm. What what were some of, like, the his the techniques he introduced? We'll, we'll start with Citizen Kane, and we can move on to, to some of his other films, because he's got a big um, filmography. But what were some of the things that... Why do people say Citizen Kane is the best movie ever made in terms of filmmaking, in terms of story... Um, in terms of how he he uses music, I mean, he used different audio techniques, video techniques, mm-hmm. um, cinematography. Tell us a little bit about the editing. That. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it's considered the greatest because it has it's a hundred percent at all of those kind of levels. You know, he really pioneered the use of in America of, of wide angle lenses. You know, he shot Citizen Kane with the twenty four millimeter lens almost exclusively, which is you know quite wide for the period when most people were using either fifty or thirty five. Um, playing scenes, you know, entirely without any kind of cutting. You know, there there's mm-hmm. several scenes that that go on where characters are walking in and out. You know, the camera's moving, and, and all of that was really revolutionary at the at the you know, time, and kind of even still today. The the standard aesthetic is, you know, if a person's talking, you have a medium or close up on them. You go to a reaction shot, or then you know go to a close up on someone else. You know, there several scenes in Kane run for three or four or five minutes without uh, a single cut. Uh, which is, you know, very uh, innovative at the time. Um, another thing I think is sound. I think people, Wells is such a great visual director that people overlook how pioneering, even, you know, particularly with Kane, how pioneering his sound technique was. And that comes from his radio days, you know, uh, like War of the Worlds and other, other mm-hmm. you know, he, he did, was doing radio for years, you know, while he was doing Broadway shows before he did, we went to Hollywood. And the idea that you could have uh, sound, you know, act as a transition, you know, sound cues acting at, you know, enhancing the quality of the, the size of the set or showing the passage of time. You know, there, mm-hmm. there's a great scene in, in Kane when, uh, you know, when he's first adopted, he's given a, a sled, you know, like another sled. And, mm-hmm. uh, the, you know, pa- camera pans up at Thatcher and Thatcher says, you know, Merry Christmas, Charles. And, and it cuts back down to young Kane and, and he says, Merry Christmas. And then it cuts back, it cuts to older Thatcher now, you know, like 20 years and later a happy new and a year. happy new year. <laughs> and, you know, that kind of jump transition, you know, it, it's really unique. It's really unique for, for a movie in 1941, but that, that's mm-hmm. something common that Wells would do. You know, that, that's a very audio you know, you could have your you could have your eyes closed, and then you can know that okay, you hear an o- younger voice, and then an older voice. You know, continuing the phrase, you know, you you can know only from the audio that twenty or five years ha- has passed or something. You know, mm-hmm. and the story being told out of order. Also, I mean, for every right. vignette, every person that um the reporter interviews, and you never really see the interviewer's face, which I mm-hmm. since you just noticed like the you just remarked the lack of reaction shots. You never really see his face. Um, perfect audience stand-in, but um, with every vignette, it's like we always go back to the beginning, back to the beginning, and you see some events from different perspectives. Mm-hmm. And I mean, at the time, I could imagine that might have thrown audiences for a bit of a loop. Like, what? Everything's told out of order? <laughs> just in terms of continuity, right. what's going on when mm-hmm. you've never really been exposed to that? Really, and probably plus, outside of maybe some books here and there. Maybe, but mm-hmm. the other thing, like how you just said, Josh, like Wells is coming from radio and all of his, the people around him came from, you know, the, well, the Mercury Theater. And that's almost like the opposite of what we're taught to do in film or what film is supposed to do. It's like show, don't tell. Here mm-hmm. he is saying you can show and tell they, or sometimes tell and not necessarily show like you don't have to play. There's no hard and fast rules when he went into this film, his first film. Mm -hmm. 
and I think it's it's interesting because years later, uh, Wells would say that uh, you know the idea of having the nonlinear story. They they he wanted to be a bit more like uh, you know he he said Rashomon because by then Rashomon had to come out the Japanese film. Uh, but uh, originally, uh, you would see uh, the the opinion of Kane would change depending on who was telling the story. You know, like if the person who loved him, you see a loving picture. Person who hated him, you see a hating picture. Uh, but he thought that Kane is shown more or less as how he is. And originally, you know, the idea of having that structure, he wanted to show, he wanted to have different perspectives. And so you would have kind of a less clear idea of who Kane was. And I think to, to do that in 1941 would have been, you know, really, uh, you know, really crazy on his part, really, really outstanding. Um, mm-hmm. And well, I think- for whatever reason, they, 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 it, it fell out of the script at some point and, you see Kane for who he is. In the, in Just the like a flat perspective, even mm-hmm. though it's told from various points of view. Um, We'd like to take this brief break to announce the next book of the month for December 2023. This book is going to be Johnny Got His Gun by Dalton Trumbo. Published in 1939, it's the aftermath of a soldier's time on the battlefields of Europe in World War I. This is a very personal book for me because I read it many, many years ago in high school. It was introduced to me by a friend of mine named Gabby who had just read it and was absolutely floored by it. She told me, you have to read this book. It will change your perspective on a lot of things. And I will say that as short as it seems and as simple as it's written, it definitely did. So when I was given the chance to recommend a book for book of the month, This was one of the first ones that popped into my mind. So I'm looking forward to rereading it, and I'm looking forward to not only hearing Dean's response to the book, but also hearing all of your responses if you're following along and reading with us. We'll be releasing the episode at the end of the month, so if you're following along, please, if you're not already subscribed to the podcast, please subscribe on YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, whatever your preferred preference of platform is. And definitely tune in for that episode to hear our thoughts. And hopefully you'll want to share yours as well. Now back to the episode. And I think I think yeah. one of the things we've actually, I don't even know if we've mentioned it yet, but one of the things, one of the reasons Wells stands out as well is he wasn't just a director and a cin- cinematographer, but he starred in many of his own movies as an mm-hmm. actor. Um, which I think in, is something important theater. to talk about as well. And and he did that in theater and, and radio. He he, kind of, he started out more as an actor in the theater. You know, he he lied about his age in Dublin when he was 15. He said he was 24 and a big Broadway success uh, when he you know was traveling around you know uh, Dublin on his inheritance. Fake it till you make he, it. Yeah, and, and uh, that's why he smoked cigars because he wanted to look older. And um, I didn't so he start, know he, that. Yeah, yeah. He started out as an actor. And then when he when he kind of started doing more American theater, he that's when he became more of a director and you know and then doing directing and radio and then eventually film. Uh, so he really started out as an actor, but I don't I don't think he really liked acting you know that much. I I think he really wanted to be at least in film he wanted to direct more. But he his persona had developed even at that young age of his, his early twenties that people wanted expected to see him. And mm-hmm. uh, it's it's really interesting, you know. Kane, he obviously he is the central figure, uh, but he doesn't appear in the Magnificent Emersons. He, he's only he's the narrator, narrator of the story, so oh, his okay. presence is still there with his voice. And 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 right. it, it, and it's not like he's the it's the voice of like the narrator. It's clearly Orson Welles telling the story. You mm-hmm. know, it's not he's not trying to hide the fact that it's it's himself. It's it's Orson Welles telling the story of the Magnificent Emersons. Um, and I, I think that that's really only one of two movies that he di- that he directed that he didn't act in. The other one would be the, the other side of the wind, which he he almost acted in that one, uh, but he was he convinced John Huston to do it instead. And uh, mm-hmm. but yeah, I, I think um, you know he he really only acted uh, later on to to get the money to for his films. You know, I, I think acting was kind of secondary, and he would always talk about how uh, he his personality only narrowed him to play or so only allowed him to play these kind of narrow parts that like these King parts, you know, they're not, mm-hmm. not necessarily the best parts, but his personality is the personality of the King or the person in power. And so he was really kind of limited to playing those kind of, of parts. And, mm-hmm. and he was aware of that, you know, that that's, that's very big. Like how he, like you said, he was aware of his limited 
range Mm -hmm. and it's like to embrace it that's very important because you get a lot of actors who try to act outside of their range and it just doesn't work whereas he just fully embraced it Mm -hmm. and you know just something i want to mention also about citizen kane and like about a bunch of his movies because one thing i like looking for in like older films is the type of acting on display, mm-hmm. whether you get like that transatlantic kind of very stiff backed acting, like, hello, how are you? Or you get a more naturalistic kind of acting that you started seeing in the 60s with Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf. Mm-hmm. And you kind of start seeing that in Citizen Kane. There's like individual moments where you can see it kind of like breaks through that like Hayes Code, like mold, and it becomes much more natural. Mm-hmm. And like you mentioning that, how it's like acting might have been secondary to him. It's like, was it part of the fact that he he was just kind of doing himself? So it was kind of like, OK, I'm just going to do this. What? Why not? You know? Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, there, there's the one scene when after Kane uh, loses the election, he's speaking with uh, Jed Leland, who is in real life. Joseph Cotton was like his real life best friend. The, 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 the low angle. Looking ears. Yeah, scene. the low angle. Oh, yeah, and there's a part that, that uh, they were shooting it late at night at Joseph Cotton had been in New York uh, doing uh, rehearsing for a play and he had just flown, you know, probably taken him like, you know, 10 or 12 hours back at the time. But he just come in. He had been up for almost 24 hours by the time they were shooting that scene. So he was he was dead tired. And as they were filming, he uh, he makes um, and it's it's in the film. He make he flubs his line. He goes, uh, I, I want to do uh, dramatic trimatism. And you can see Wells kind of smiling, laughing, and and he didn't yell cut. And, and Joe Khan just kept going, you know. And, and he says dramatic. Oh, you know what I mean. That that was all improvised. That that happened naturally. At and the Wells time, that's that's like unheard yeah. of with film costs mm-hmm. and everything. Not until like on the waterfront, where you got like Marlon Brando picking up the glove and playing with it during the scene. Like you didn't see anything spontaneous like that back then right yeah and and wells loved a uh, little happy accents that's what he said a director really does is that a director is someone who just presides over a series of happy accidents and any any time like a little accent like that would happen he would he would love it and he would keep it in the film and you it's know there, natural. There's, there's one story that his his daughter told about in chimes at midnight where they were shooting just this just the shot that would only be in like the opening credits there's um you know people walking like soldiers walking and mm-hmm. uh one of the extras was really just the waiter that that wells had admired from his favorite restaurant and he thought and he thought he just had such a wonderful face he had to be just somewhere in the film so we had him at the tail end of this line of soldiers walking and a, a big oh. gust of wind came and knocked his hat off and uh you know according to his daughter any 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 professionally trained actor would have yelled, "Oh crap! You know, cut, we got to start. We got to do it again." And mm-hmm. Wells left the camera going. The you know the, the hack was off, and the guy stops. Turn, you know, kind of runs after, it, picks up, puts it back on his head, and it keeps walking for it. Keeps going through the sea, and and Wells was <laughs> roaring with laughter. He loved it, and it, and it ends up. You know, it's one of the first shots in the movie, and you know this like mm-hmm. total accident. Yeah, he just he loved uh, things like that. He loved like any any kind of mistake. In life. Mm-hmm. And that, that's I, something I, I you love, don't see in a lot of a lot of more professional films refined. that have uh, you know really strict uh, structures. Yeah. yeah, I love Chimes at Midnight or Falstaff, whatever you mm-hmm. want to call it. I love that movie um, Henry the Fourth, Henry V. I mean, I love the the plays that they're based on and the fact that he was able to take something so well known, um, make it seem you know some quote historically accurate you know it looked like it mm-hmm. was in the time period he followed word for word you know what shakespeare had written but he somehow was able to change the focus of the story um and took a you know a, a minor secondary character and kind of i, w- I don't know if i call him the lead role um but definitely gave him a bigger presence um mm-hmm. in those plays and in the film uh than shakespeare had yeah, he, Falstaff was a figure Wells was obsessed with. You know, his whole life he uh, he started as a play of called Five Kings in 1938 or 30, 39, and he he played the role of Falstaff at at 24 years old in heavy makeup wow. on the stage. And yeah, you know, he he, he tried for years to do it as a play several times because initially it failed. And he was actually he kept all the sets in storage for I think maybe like 10 or 15 years and paid out of his own pocket you know, all that time to keep the, that initial set because he wanted to do it eventually. And, and then so he did it later on. So that's why we have a film instead of a play right. for it. Oh, mm-hmm. that's cool. Yeah, and he, he did the play again in, in Dublin in uh, the 60s uh, with uh, um, Keith Baxter as Hal. And I think some of the other people that would end up in the movie were also in the play. But uh, 
you know, he, he had discovered uh, Keith Baxter for the stage play. And at one point, you know, as they're wrapping up the play, he go, you know, he was preparing to do the movie and he goes, you know, Keith, I, I'm, we're going to do the movie, but like, I'm not going to do the movie if you're not going to be how, uh, and mm-hmm. you know, he was insisting that, that he, he joined him for the movie. And, uh, you know, and, and Keith Baxter later said that he felt that the play was just a preparation for the movie that they were going to do, you know, when they were doing the play, he didn't quite have, well, didn't have the plan to do the movie, anything for it, but he knew he could tell that this was something that Wells was so passionate for that he was going to try and do a movie mm-hmm. of it. And of course that ended up being his, his masterpiece. Uh, I, I love it. I, I think it was, I mean, I, I think it was the first Wells movie I had actually, I had seen and like sat down and paid attention to the whole time through. And as soon as it ended, mm-hmm. like I just re I just started it again. I, I, there are very few movies I've done that with. I just absolutely fell in love with that movie. Yeah, it's it's something that you you you're kind of left speechless. You you feel like you're kind of punched in the gut at the end of that movie uh, because yeah. the emotions are so high, and then it's such a yeah, it's a really it's a really devastating and brutal movie emotionally. It's probably probably the most emotional movie, the most personal movie you can see you can see in his his oeuvre, I think. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, and another thing I wanted to mention, because uh, Brad, mm-hmm. you you had, you had mentioned how uh, Wells stayed really true to like the dialogue, which is which is true. You know, word mm-hmm. wordly, he would he would stay true to Shakespeare's lines, but he would always um, take parts of other Shakespeare plays and put them in others. He did that with with Falstaff. You know, he took uh, lines from like uh, you know I think the Merry Wives of Windsor, which is another play that Falstaff oh. appears in that's not related to Henry the, right. the King plays. And, and even in his theater days, he would he would take parts from you know, he one time he was doing Julius Caesar, and he he took a whole scene, a whole like uh, soliloquy from I think um, I think Titus and Judicus. He he, uh, he took that, a, yep, this whole this whole whole soliloquy, gave it to a, a whole other character in Caesar, and <laughs> made it in the in the middle of the thing. And uh, even his, his huh. film of Macbeth, he he created a whole new character. Uh, of uh, the holy priest, which and he made, uh, uh, he made uh, Catholic or Christianity this overwhelming presence in his film. Which it's again nowhere in the text of Shakespeare is there anything <laughs> about kind of Christianity. But he created right. this whole other character and gave him lines from three or four other characters in Macbeth, and also other lines from other Shakespeare plays to create this presence of Christianity really out of nowhere. Uh, and and he did that wow. all the time. He did that. He did that. Uh, not not quite as much, I think, in Falstaff because of how how uh, much he stayed. He 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 appreciated that character. But I think in Othello, he did that too. He did that really in Macbeth and all all through his theater days. You know, he he felt no kind of you know strict reverence for the text. If he if he thought it would look, if he thought it would help the story, he would cut pages. He would cut characters. Uh, you know, Othello as a as a play, I think it's like a three hour long. Play. Mm-hmm. His movie is ninety minutes. You know, his movie is like oh, ninety two wow. minutes. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. You know, he he cut a lot of. You know, he very he economical. That of, yeah, yeah. And was but and was most of that for artistic reasons or for budget reasons or for audiences not wanting to sit I, at a, in a movie <laughs> for three hours or. <laughs> Well, you know? I, I think it's I think it's more artistic, you know. Othello, in particular, I've never seen a full version of of the play, but from what I what I've read is that uh, Iago has a lot of lines where he is kind of summarizing what is happening, and, and Iago speaks to the audience. And okay. so I think a lot of what uh, you know Othello, in particular, Wells cut was more theatrical kind of stuff, stuff that you don't need in a visual, you know, in a, in a cinematic movie. You know, you mm-hmm. can do things, you can you can tell. But in a certain shot or or a glance, you could you could say certain you could tell certain things that the character on a stage play would have to speak, you know. Right. Yep. And I think I think even Falstaff and uh, Macbeth, you know, he did similar things. You know, he would things that were you would need in a in a stage in order to, like someone describing the scene of the ships attacking or the ships coming. You know, right. Wells had model ships. You know, you know that kind of thing. So. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, but. The- like how you were mentioning about like the stage play. It's like, I just immediately thought of like Kenneth Branagh, how he made, uh, I think it was Henry V and Hamlet mm-hmm. and both, I think it was Henry V. He took scenes from Henry IV and moved them into the movie because mm-hmm. it's, again, it's, you can show these things. You don't need a character explaining them to you. And the same went with his Hamlet production. Mm-hmm. Um, 
And then the other thing, how you were mentioning, like, you know, about Wells' stage days, I remembered um, a tidbit I read about Touch of Evil, which is one of my favorite of Wells' films visually. Like, I just like mm-hmm. watching the camera work in that movie. Um, a story that I guess he rehearsed his cast for about two weeks before the film started production. They went through the whole script and they rewrote parts of it. Mm-hmm. And they just kind of like create, you know, the characters were already on the page, but they created the characters and they created the story kind of as they went along. A lot like what Sidney Lumet did with like Dog Day Afternoon. Um, so not not to his... interrupt you, it's just oh, to go off of that, because I'm, I'm, I'm not a film guy, as you guys mm-hmm. know, and you both are. Is that, I, is that not normal to, uh, to like prepare... A movie in it's, that way leading up to production to prepare i mean uh, to prepare yes but maybe not to that extent okay um and also to allow like i mean this is in in my perspective like to, to allow the actors to have so much mm-hmm. leeway and that probably comes from wells's background as an actor he knows gotcha. what it's like on both sides so mm-hmm. it's like you know if janet lee couldn't do a scene the way it was written, how can we have Janet Lee be able to do it? You know, it's like she's a terrific actress, mm-hmm. same with Charlton Heston. Um, so, yeah, I just thought of those two things, and I forget exactly where I was going with this, but that happens. Well, <laughs> Wells did that on on almost every uh, shoot he did. He was always constantly uh-huh. rewriting. He was always adapting to circumstance, you know, whether it was due to, you know, shortage mm-hmm. of funds or a happy accident or an idea someone else had. He, he was always willing to change uh, what he had prepared. I mean, he he always prepared mm-hmm. his films in a lot of great detail. That way he that that way he allowed himself to be able to be kind of free to those, you know those moments. Yeah, yeah. And with his his acting troupe, you know, uh, even in Touch of Evil, you know, any of his American films, he really worked with the kind of the same core group of actors. That you know, mm-hmm. not only were they working on like the same films, but they they had started all like in theater. You know, Wells met Joseph Kahn in in the theater in, in 1935, 36. And, you know, he, you know, he ends up in touch of evil too. He ends up in F for fake. So, you know, there, oh, yeah. the, there's movie. a lot of actors that uh, even, even in his European career, you know, there's quite a few actors who made several movies with him and he, you know, he liked them. I think he, he always wanted to work with his friends and, but he also had a really interesting set of actor friends, you know, like, uh, Akeem Tamaroff, who was in touch of evil as Grandy. He's a really weird, mm-hmm. he's a really, you know, weird looking guy, you know, if we were to be on a movie, <laughs> uh, but Wells always used him in a way that really, uh, was really fitting for him in, in the story, you know, whether it's an Arcaden or, or touch of evil, he shows up in the trial. He was uh, Sancho Panza in his unfinished Don Quixote. So he, you know, he really mm-hmm. knew how to get the most out of these interesting actor friends that he had in his life. So that, uh, yeah, I didn't know that he rehearsed his actors like that, but I knew that he had like that surrounding of the same mm-hmm. people and that he always used their strength. Um, so the other thing I remembered about, um, like reading about the rehearsal times and the scripts for touch of evil was that he purposely wanted to confuse and kind of infuriate the audience with how complicated the film was. And that Mm -hmm. it was just funny thinking of that after how you mentioned one of his Shakespeare at Othello, I think you said where it's like 90 minutes and the stage plays like three hours. Um, And then just like how we were discussing about citizen Kane, how deeply metaphorical a lot of parts of that movie are not only the use of light and shadow, but also just, the script and how you know the sled like you know his his dear rosebud being replaced by a brand new sled and that's like the end of his childhood Mm -hmm. um and it's just i remember from my film school days so a lot of arrogance um people trying to say with some films that orson welles kind of valued style over substance at times um not really a question, just something that I remember hearing from a lot of my mm-hmm. peers in the early 2000s, looking back on a lot of his film work. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that kind of touches mm-hmm. on one of the the questions. I think we had touched on it earlier, but mm-hmm. um, we had talked a little bit about it with Citizen Kane, but things that lots people of people have wrong. gotten wrong about yes. Wells and their perception of of his character and his style and his way of His visual, getting things audio, done. storytelling mm-hmm. style. Yeah, and it, it's really it's really strange too because if you look at Wells' films, he doesn't do a lot of in his early films. 
you know, he he does he, he does a lot of the long take. He does a lot of camera moves. He, so he does things that don't necessarily he were you know, in his opinion, like draw attention to itself. You know, that was always his big, you know, concern with his, his style of filmmaking. He always liked the film to look, uh, to, to not draw attention to itself as a medium. And mm-hmm. I think that's why he liked long takes is that way the audience is paying attention to the story that's happening and the characters acting and not necessarily the, the camera movements. And I was actually just watching Touch of Evil uh, yesterday with um, the one commentary track by uh, James Nairmore and uh, Jonathan Rosenbaum, two great you know, cinema scholars also, you know, really fantastic books on Wells. And they were were commenting about how, uh, you know, the opening shot of Touch of Evil is, is, you know, iconic now. It's a a legendary, you know, three and a half minute shot. We have camera movements, moving all all these hundreds of extras and stuff. And Mm -hmm. and Wells, uh, apparently, according to, I I forget which one of them said it, but, you know, Wells was a little insecure about that shot because he felt that the the movement drew attention to itself. You know, everyone, everyone now is, uh, is in awe of, you know, the camera movement. They're not necessarily paying attention to the dramatic uh, nature of, of the shot, which is, you know, there's a bomb and a car being driven next to the two main characters, you know, what, you know, what's going to happen, you know, and he was, he was much more, at least with that film, he was more proud of uh, a scene later in the movie when they're doing the interrogation of uh, in the, the suspect house. In, in his apartment. And it's, it's three, it's three different shots and they're all done in, in one take. You know, they're, the first one is about five minutes. There's one in the middle uh, that's about a minute and a half. And then there's the final one, which is another like five minute take. And he did that all on the first day of shooting. Uh, you know, they rehearsed it for about eight or nine hours and the and the studio executives were getting so worried because Wells went like eight hours without shooting uh, a scene, and then at like five thirty at night they 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 did it and they did like three whole scenes you know about ten or twelve pages of of script in about three hours, uh, wow. and that scene technically it's not quite as flashy as the opening but it's much more. You know the the impact of it's much more dramatically appreciated, I think, because it's it doesn't really draw attention to itself. You have you do have a lot of camera movement, but it's really more of just kind of back and forth. But the whole what makes it more exciting is the way that the actors are moving and and the dynamic between them. And it's it's really you know when I was watching yesterday, I was like, man, like that that that's the that's the shot. Like that's the one that like mm-hmm. people should be studying. Not not nec- I mean, the opening shot is really cool. You know, it's really flashy. It really draws you into the story, but. Like from a from a technical, you know, whether you're an audience member appreciating the dra- dra- the uh, drama of it, or you're a, a technical person, people like we are as filmmakers or creatives, you know that that has it both. I think more so than the opening, uh, mm-hmm. the opening scene. Yep. And um, there was there was one more thing about Touch of Evil I want to bring up. So oh yeah, so you were mentioning John about how Wells wanted to kind of confuse the audience and and kind of make them infuriated with the ending. And of course, uh, yeah. I, I don't know if I can, if I should. I guess I've got to kind of spoil the the ending, but uh, I think it's been I'll, long I'll, enough. I'll, I'll try not to. Um, <laughs> but the the su- the suspect in the end, you know, uh, admits to the the crime, or you know, the, mm-hmm. the one character says, "Oh, he confessed." You know, he, you know, the, the basically saying the whole plot, the whole drama of the movie didn't really have to happen because the guy was guilty of it anyway. And you know, we all kind of take that for a fact because it's said in the movie. But one of the things that uh, uh, Rosenbaum and Nairmore bring up in their commentary is that, you know, not so not so much at the time in the fifties, but now we are more accustomed to, you know, police like beating, you know, false Nihilism. confessions out of people. Yeah. So we're, you know, in, like audiences nowadays are they they shouldn't take it for for a fact that he really is guilty. You know, just because they're saying that he confessed to it you know knowing what we know now about kind of false confessions and and different you know behavior from the the state uh, i think it makes the that the ending now is much more uh i think depressive the you know depressing than it was maybe in in 56 when the when the people ha- when the general audience had more faith in their elected officials mm-hmm. and and the police and things like that and you know uh no. yeah I, I i agree because it's i remember seeing that movie for the first time and you know, that's one thing that struck me with Orson Welles was how kind of downbeat his stories mm-hmm. are. Because like with The Magnificent Ambersons, the ending that was tacked on by Hollywood the, when it was recut is actually closer to the book than Orson Welles' original ending. He mm-hmm. made it more depressing, but more realistic and more dramatic. At the end of Touch of Evil, I remember just thinking, does this movie even have an answer? 
Like, does it mm-hmm. even like you don't know who's faking in it? It's like by the end, I was just kind of like watching it for the experience and seeing how the mm-hmm. characters kind of like moved through this almost needless drama, like you said. Um, and then the other thing, like how you were talking about, um, like the opening shot of Touch of Evil and the fancy camera work versus the very stagey, simplistic, but very dramatic apartment interrogation scene. It just reminded me of a quote I remember hearing from some random documentary once about Amelie, the Jean-Pierre Juanette movie Mm -hmm. from like 2001. And that movie, like he has some of the most fanciful camera work you can imagine, like the most imaginative cameras going upside down and over bridges and all this stuff. And then at the very end of the movie, it's simple reaction, reaction, reaction shots when the dramatic heft of the movie starts. Mm -hmm. And he purposely said, I knew I had to calm the camera down because that's not what it was about. It was about Mm -hmm. the characters and the story and the action and just recognizing that. So when you were talking about those two scenes being held side to side, that that's the first thing I thought of was that quote. Cause I remember hearing that as a filmmaker and a creative, it's like, I took that so much to heart with my own stuff, knowing Mm -hmm. when to let the characters speak and when to show off. Right. Anyway, and rant done. There's a there's a funny story about how um, there's a shot in uh, the Lady from Shanghai. It's a very simple shot where it's the mm. uh, the the lawyer character uh, of uh, Everett Sloan, played by Everett Sloan, and then Rita Hayworth. They're sitting on a bench and they're talking, and all it's just this really simple like dolly in. You know, it's like two minutes while they're they're speaking. They just dolly in from like kind of a wider shot to like a medium close up, and. In, uh, in one of their interviews uh, with uh, Wells and Bogdanovich, uh, they were talking about that scene, and Bogdanovich goes, "You know, I, I was watching it, and I realized that's that's all one take, and it's probably one of the slowest dolly shots I've ever seen because I was looking at the edge of the of the screen and seeing how it get closer, closer." And Wells goes, "He goes, well, it probably isn't that interesting of a scene if you're looking at the corners of the frame to see it, you know, sliding in." <laughs> I love in, that. I love you know. <laughs> <laughs> so he, he was kind of, you know. <laughs> criticizing himself or, or you know uh like making fun of himself like well like i got i guess i didn't do a good job making the scene interesting if you were paying attention that's the, the first thing you of, noticed of the camera yeah um well, yeah, that, I mean, I mean, but, I, but, but, but that wasn't what you noticed the first time you saw it i assume yeah i mean i don't, well, I don't I mean, know i i think i only noticed after read after hearing you know bogdan okay. say that. i think i was like mm-hmm. right was like yeah oh yeah it's true yeah that, that is, is really funny, like, but it's all- I think yeah. it's also like how you were talking about it's Peter Bogdanovich. It's like, mm-hmm. it depends what you're looking at when you're watching the movie too. Like you go into Citizen Kane knowing about the cinematography and knowing about the exceptional reputation it has. That's part of what you're going to be looking at. Whereas like the scene you just described in a lady from Shanghai, right? The very mm-hmm. slow push in it's like psychologically, it's supposed to mean like, Oh, you're getting more intimate. The scene's getting more intense, that sort of thing. And I would imagine first time viewers, they don't even notice it. Like the casual viewer mm. almost who are focused on the story. So I think it depends on the audience to an extent mm-hmm. who is watching it and what are they looking for in Wells. And I think that also speaks to his, his, his character and his personality. I think he was much more humble mm. than, you know, people would expect someone like him to be because they expect, you know, that in real life, they expect to see the same Orson Welles that they see, they see on the screen. Big bombastic, mm-hmm. you know, and he would he would character. sometimes he would sometimes play to that depending on who he was talking to. Like I know, for example, another the Bogdanovich story is that uh, uh, at some point, like early in the friendship, Bogdanovich said he didn't really like uh, the trial, uh, and Wells was like, "Yeah, like I'm not really a fan of that one. I think I'd be so he it was his he, favorite." Yeah, he but he he kind of uh, you know submitted to Bogdanovich not liking the film because he didn't want to hurt Bogdanovich's feelings by saying he liked it so much. And for years he would always refer to it as oh that movie Peter doesn't like. And then it wasn't until <laughs> it wasn't until some years later that that I don't know if, if he had said it to Bogdanovich or Bogdanovich had heard him say how much Wells liked like you know like the trial. Uh, and Bogdanovich asked him, as, oh, like, you know, I, you said all those years, you know, you, you agree with me. And Wells said something to the effect of like, well, like, I didn't want to like hurt your feelings or like I didn't want to, you know, uh, you know, have this too big of an argument with you about it. Like he, yeah. you know, he just wanted he just to, want, you know, your opinion's valid and I, mm-hmm. I, I'll agree with it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. And there's another story, too, that I think it's Jonathan Rosenbaum. He met him once in Paris and probably around the time he was making I think he had just Effort Fake had just come out. And Rosenbaum's uh, uh, observation of Wells is that he was someone who had a really big ego, 
but he was someone, but he was aware of how big his ego was. So he, he really tried, he really made a, a he really big himself. effort to, to check himself and to, and to not show off, not to really try and downplay his, his ego. And I, I think that's really interesting because you would think that Wells would be just all, I mean, he is a really all consuming person on the screen. You would expect him to be like that in real life. And, you know, he, it seems like he really wasn't, it seems like he was much more of a, like a friendly bear than uh, <laughs> his detractors would, would give him credit for. Yeah. I mean, so what I, was I, it? No, go ahead, John. I, I was, was going to say like, he, he was, ahead. he was the member of some like magicians society. Mm -hmm. If I remember, and he was the, he was a member for it for his whole life, like up until late in his life, and he went to their regular meetings and everything. And it's like, you know, just imagine you're like, you know, like a little birthday magician. You know, you play in New Jersey, and you go to some kids' birthday parties, and Orson Welles walks in, and it's like, hey guys, what's up? It's like, it's like, it, it's nice hearing a story like like how humble and everyday he was, especially when you read a, you hear about the magician thing or any story mm. like that. It's like, okay, yeah, that that checks, that makes sense, and there's it's refreshing. We'd like to take a brief moment to thank you for listening to Story Weavers. For the enjoyment of our listeners, we want to keep this podcast ad free and uninterrupted. If you would like to support us further, check out our options on Patreon. Plus, subscribing will get you behind-the-scenes content, bloopers, access to Book of the Month polls, and more. We appreciate any and all support. Now back to the episode. Yeah, yeah. so I, I wanted to ask, um, getting a little bit more, more personal, but what, when did you discover Orson Welles, and when did you, like, when did you fall in love with him? What made mm -hmm. you fall in love with him, and what made you want to pursue his you know watching his filmography and learning more about him and then as an extension to the question um and we'll talk about this more in the next episode but what inspirations you draw from him um in your own creative endeavors mm -hmm. i mean i've i've always loved cinema and i knew from a really early point in my life that i wanted to be you know some kind of filmmaker actor just involved in in cinema and, you know, my, my taste changed growing up, you know, watching different films. And, you know, at some point I, I had heard of just Orson Welles and Citizen Kane and Citizen Kane is the greatest film ever made. And but I, I didn't really I never really watched it until um, I, I know exactly when I watched it because Citizen Kane premiered on May 1st, 1941, which is my birth. My, I was born on May 1st, 1990. And I'm pretty sure I think it was 2005 when uh turner classic movies had uh citizen kane on at eight o'clock on may 1st then uh you know i had nothing better to do as a 15 year old on a on a weekday night or something so i, I was like oh you know I, i've always heard about this movie let me watch it and stuff like that and uh i yeah and i that was it that was i was like i was like enraptured Who? yeah i was just like what is this movie like what is going on here and i just i knew i had to learn more about Orson Welles and I, I tried to seek out as many movies as his as I could and and it's it's kind of interesting because at the time you know it's, it's strange it's oh, I think 18 years ago now uh crazy mm -hmm. to think that 2005 was 18 yeah, years no ago kidding um, no, no, I feel but old. the the rights to a lot of Welles's later work were always in dispute for for decades and they, they've always been like really hard to find and uh you know some of them had like kind of fallen out of copyright so there'd be like really low quality copies available and um, so it was really tough, you know, and like in that kind of early in the mid 2000s to find uh, some of Wells' work on on home uh, yeah. video, and, like on and home and, media. And, and for a, a little perspective, if I'm not mistaken, 2000, in 2005, uh, Google hadn't bought YouTube yet. <laughs> so like it, it's not it wasn't <laughs> even really. But my, but my point being, like back then, you couldn't just like go online and find a website mm -hmm. to stream a movie. Mm -hmm. You know, right. legally, illegally, whatever. Um, yeah, it, yeah, well, it, it wasn't as easy as it it. was today. I, I have yeah, a, a Bay of Pirates uh, to thank for being able to find yes. some of Wells's uh, later <laughs> films. You know, like I, I, I watched the. I think I watched both the Trial and and Tribes of Midnight on like these really low, like 480p transfers, yeah. <laughs> uh, really bad quality. Uh, but even then, I w it was still like, wow, like I, they still had like this power to them. 
And, and it made me appreciate more, I think, later in life when, you know, I think in the last like maybe six or seven years, they've untangled some of the legal issues uh, regarding his films. You know, Criterion has put out so many of his movies uh, in really high quality. There's been, you know, the, uh, uh, Chanel, uh, they, they just did a, 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 re- a restoration of the trial for its 60th anniversary. And uh, the the clothing company Chanel was the one that that paid for the financing of it for some reason. You know, I was going to say, no was idea. that ch- the Chanel? I think it is. Yeah, yeah. They wow. just like they just had some money. They they just and and uh, and uh, they came out. You know, earlier this year, I watched it in in the film form in New York City, and it was incredible because I'd never seen a copy of it in such a good and good quality and it was like seeing a whole new movie and and also just seeing it in a movie theater was it was an incredible experience even though film form is kind of small you know unfortunately not not to dig at them but uh it was still <laughs> like you're in a you're in a, bl- a dark place with an audience and you know seeing a movie in that whether it's the way it was meant to be viewed or, or film yeah uh but it was it's it was really interesting that like uh his films were were unavailable here for so long and uh you know, it's only after his like hundredth and you know the centennial of his birth when he was getting really good restorations of his work and and stuff. And but yeah, that, I mean, at a fifteen, seeing you know those films and you know as a teenager, I remember the, one of the one of the first things I can remember like kind of buying on my own with my own money as a, as a as a adult. I was eighteen. I just, I just graduated high school. I had some high school graduation money, and Barnes Nobles had this really big book called Orson Welles at Work. And it was, mm-hmm. it, it's one of my, one of the best things I ever bought. It was like 80 bucks. It was the, at that the point it was the most expensive thing I'd ever <laughs> yeah, bought right. on my own. And I've, I've read that so many times in the last like 15 years. Like I just, I'll pick it up and I'll just like open up through like a page on like Othello and just read about, you know, it's such a detailed book. Um, and I think, I think having that book at an early age really, uh, really influenced my, ideas for what it is to be a filmmaker and and not not just the filmmaker but like an independent filmmaker you know wells was mm-hmm. really that that prototype for you know what a lot of us are now this being an independent making films on your own and uh he was you know 100 years ahead of his time in, in some ways i think mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that's cool i think uh i just want to say i just think that wells is a as famous as he is as appreciated as he is I still think there's so much more that can be said about. I still think he he needs much more appreciation than he gets. Even though he gets a lot, he he is still you know kind of the godfather of of cinema and American cinema. Um, but I, I think that I think that's still not enough praise for yeah for well, him. He gets a lot. He I mean he gets a lot, but I think his his films Citizen probably gets... get let's say Citizen Kane, mm-hmm. you know, and a couple of his films probably get a lot more uh, than he does. Nowadays. Well, it, it, it's like I would I would almost say like that Citizen Kane's the one dominating factor and that's kind of like overshadows everything mm-hmm. else. Everything else, yeah. Because Citizen Kane was him playing with his friends essentially. You know, you get mm-hmm. Greg Tolland, Robert Wise, and Orson Welles was like, I don't know how to film. Help me. And it's like they all it right. was like this great collaborative collaborative experience. And his later films start to hone his eye. I would say. So I, I think that's, you start to see more of Orson Welles in his later films. I mean, you see a lot in Citizen Kane. I'm not saying you don't, but mm-hmm. I, I hope what I'm saying makes sense. Mm-hmm. Um, so I just think his a, a whole lot of his filmography. Later films, yeah, a lot mm-hmm. of his later films are, are surprisingly different. They're, they're similar to Kane, oh, yeah. but stylistically, they're actually very different than than Kane. And, and later in life, you would say that Kane was like probably the worst thing that ever happened to him because for the rest of his, for the rest of his life it's everything so, it was, was a shadow up to, it's so overshadows yeah and uh, I, I, I mean think, that I think his, world uh, worlds mm-hmm. and I think some of his later films are just they're just too uh, uh, too avant-garde for for most audiences Cerebral. unfortunately F yeah, is fake or F, F for fake. fake touch of evil other side of the wind I mean they're they're extraordinary films but you they're not they're not something that you can kind of just casually watch you know they're not something you just right. put on and you know they're like you you're gonna watch a wells movie you're gonna be kind of speechless afterwards you know you're mm-hmm. it's, it's gonna okay. have an effect on you yeah. mm-hmm. so so for the people who um either maybe have only seen citizen kane or have or are not familiar with wells works what mm-hmm. films other than citizen kane um would you recommend they start with 
Uh, definitely, you know, A Chimes at Midnight, uh, The Trial is, is fantastic. I love The Other Side of the Wind, which, you know, took him 40 years to complete. Uh, I'm, I'm a really big fan of Othello. I, I think that's, you know, visually his most exciting film the editing i love it i love the story about you know he took four years to make it on and off in morocco and mogador and venice and i I think you know that one he made totally independently he had no outside money other than his own and it it won uh the you know the palm d'or at at Cannes in 52 Mm. i think i think that's yeah i i think that is really that that's wells at his most uh Wellsian, uh, his most Wellsian, I think, and <laughs> uh, I just, I, I love. I mean, it's a little, it's a little, uh, hasn't aged too well because you know he's, you know, he's playing the role of Othello, which is, mm-hmm. you know, this black part, and he's, you know, born in Wisconsin, uh, you know, but uh, so it's a little, not, not quite as, as correct as, as you know, uh, certain audiences want today, but I think, you know. Uh, I'm getting on a tangent of Othello, but he he had actually that's uh, another another podcast episode. But yeah, I think like Othello <laughs> is a great uh, it's a, it's a great place, a great film to watch. I think that's probably my favorite of his. Uh, yeah, I, I think yeah, Othello, The Trial, Touch of Evil, Chimes at Midnight, Chimes at Midnight. Um, yes, F for Fake is fantastic. I mean, this hard. Mm-hmm. You, it's, just watch all of them. Yeah, you know, just yeah, start in order and and watch his career develop. I think. Uh, all right. Well, Josh, we want to thank you so much for uh, coming on and talking to us about one of the greatest filmmakers, American filmmakers, uh, personalities of of the 20th century um, and of cinematography in general. Um, it's fun learning a little bit more about him uh, and some of the unique things um, that make his work stand out. Um and so we'll we'll wrap this one up here, um, and then we're going to continue on in episode two, talking about Josh's uh, film Analogic, which came out in 2019? No, uh, 2021. 2022. 2022. Wow. Mm-hmm. Got that way off. I apologize. Um, and we'll learn a little bit... Um, about that film, if you want to watch it before the episode, uh, you can find it on YouTube, Josh Pomponio, Analogic. It's a short 20, 25-minute film, absolutely phenomenal. Um, and so we will catch back up with you then. Thanks for having me, guys. Yep, thanks again. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of Story Weavers. As ever, we're incredibly grateful to all of our listeners and contributors. Come back next week for the next installment of Story Weavers. Weavers.